to myself. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not a community researcher, um, so um, uh, I'm not going to uh, pretend I am, but I am a, uh, an academic collaborator with community researchers, and um, um, uh, so I'm offering that perspective. Although I am drawing on, um, let's get this correct, I'm drawing on uh, quite a lot on a chapter that's been um, uh, that's going to be forthcoming, we hope, sometime next year for Policy Press that's uh, uh, looking at our experience of collaboration that's authored by a combination of university researchers, uh, 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 practitioners, and uh, um, community researchers who identify themselves as what we often call lived experience researchers. I'll say perhaps a bit more about that later. I mean, perhaps it would just be helpful to get a sense in the room. Um, I mean, at this conference, it might be easy to assume that everybody's an ac academic, but there might not be. So, um, um, who here, who, well, who here would describe themselves as a, an academic? Um, yeah, okay, so there's some people, that, who, who here would describe themselves as a community partner researcher? Yeah, yeah, um, okay, uh, but what, what about a, a, a student? I mean, I would count that as academic, but maybe somebody, Yes, okay. I'm trying to get the, the, the man who hasn't raised, I think there's two of you who haven't raised your hands to either of those labels. So, um, um, but I don't want to put you on the spot, you see. I'm, I'm trying to guess what, what your labels are. But maybe you're a professional working in, in a practitioner of some kind? Used to be that. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Uh, you work, you work in government. Okay, so yeah, so, so, so I think we would label you as a practitioner. And when we had, and we've got a project at the moment where we're collaborating with people in local government with Blackpool Council and, and so on. So a real mixture of uh, um, what we have in our research. Although here, I suppose we've got a mixture of what we might label practitioners and, and uh, academics, but fortunately we've got community partner researchers on the panel to share their experience. I'm just going to talk um, for about... Uh, 10 to 15 more minutes, not quite 15, about um, the Imagine project, which was part of the, the whole Connected Communities uh, program, uh, of which uh, uh, creative, uh, no, sorry, Productive Margins was part of too. Um, our our uh, project, the Imagine project, was interested um, in exploring ways in which uh, um, universities and communities could engage in uh, research that uh, help people imagine and potentially bring into being um, better futures. So it was a very broad remit and there were kind of four strands um, of the project. Um, I was involved one which was um, labelled the social context and what we were interested in was ways in which uh, uh, community uh, and, and, and universities could collaborate to uh, research but also try and bring about um, a ways in which we can make more resilient collective futures. Okay. I'm not going to go into the detail of the topic about that um, uh, so much because I'm really talking about that process of collaboration which is one of the big learning things from the Imagine pro program as a whole was to try and understand how can uh, universities and uh, uh, community partner uh, researchers effectively uh, collabor uh, collaborate. Um, we began um, uh, in collaboration um, with the uh, Greater Manchester Centre for Voluntary Organisation um, and uh, colleagues at the University of Brighton carrying out a, a a scoping review of what we know already and interviewing um, um, both community partners and uh, um, uh, academics from higher education about their experiences of collaborating in, in research. Um, their findings were that what makes for effective partnership is that um, people, you know, understand it's an ongoing learning experience, you know, not expecting things necessarily to be perfect, but an openness for, 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 for both partners to learn from it. Um, a degree of trying to accept that there are differences, but actually trying to reframe those into opportunities. And that's something I'm going to come back to later. This sense of actually not being afraid of difference or boundaries, but rather of uh, um, uh, trying to harness that. Um, some honesty about um, um, power dynamics. And I say honesty about that because actually it's not necessarily about saying we can completely equalise power dy dynamics. In a lot of ways, um, uh, academics have a lot of privilege with regard to engaging in, in things, but also awareness of power dynamics, actually think about the consequences and trying to uh, minimise the negative uh, impact of those uh, becomes important in a very practical way. I mean, we have sort of constant sort of battles with various funders about making sure that um, um, uh, uh, the community partners uh, uh, receive relevant um, uh, funding for participation and so on. Um, okay, really thinking about the social aspect of the partnership. Um, so when we 
when we meet, um, um, paying, paying attention to that, um, uh, playing to each other's strengths. Um, and perhaps something else is that, I mean, um, sometimes perhaps academics like myself can, um, who, who spend a lot of time do, doing research can think that, well, it's kind of almost all or nothing, but uh, uh, there's this um, uh, notion that actually people can collaborate and participate with different levels of involvement. Um, and actually, being a collaborator doesn't mean that everybody has to put the same amount of time in. Um, uh, people are familiar with uh, the communities of, pra uh, of practice literature, uh, Etienne Bengo, um, might come across this term it's a bit jargonistically, but legitimate peripheral participation. The notion, what that means, is that actually sometimes people on the edge can bring most to it. Um, in fact, a colleague here from, who's here from government, we had one of our really interesting sessions we had, we had somebody coming from a local authority who just attended one afternoon, but it was really interesting, that person on the outside coming in and offering something, offering a perspective that helped energise the discussion that was happening within our collaboration. Okay, I'll move to the next one. Okay, so in our Imagine project we had um, um, four, um, um, 15 different community um, university projects that were looking at how people responded to different types of ad adversities, be they health, discriminatory, um, we had strands around child and family resilience, um, we had strands around uh, 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 teacher and school uh, resilience, we had uh, strands looking at uh, young adult and adult resilience, they were looking at projects with people with learning disabilities and mental health challenges, and then we were also looking at re resilient models and practice research. Quite a diverse range uh, of projects, but by their very nature it meant that actually, you know, we had um, um, a combination of academics, practitioners, and people with lived experience, often of quite um, um, uh, challenging um, uh, health and, 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 and social um, uh, issues. We use the community as a practice approach, um, and that's um, uh, people might be familiar with the work of uh, uh, Wenger, which is the notion of bringing together people who share a, a common concern, and they were kind of originally designed to cut across organisation barriers and hierarchies. But they kind of developed in quite a mono-professional culture. The first communities of practice, you know, were, were formed within, within organisations, uh, within single professionals. But actually over the last decade, they've been gradually been used for more uh, mixed collaborations of people um, um, uh, uh, from diverse backgrounds. And we were using it um, uh, to combine what we call lived experience experts, uh, practitioners and academics. One of the key ways our project went on for about four or five years, um, we actually used research retreats, which sounds a very dry sort of term, but, but actually we didn't, we didn't actually label them retreats until, um, 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 or we didn't use the term until towards the end, but that meant we had annual meetings where we all came together from these different projects. Um, and um, um, uh, there's a lot of guidance about research retreats for interdisciplinary work, but very much um, located within the academic world. Um, uh, whereas we were wanting to use these meetings and bringing together of peoples uh, over two days to uh, um, uh, bring together those different types of knowledge and expertise. The challenges were those different knowledges, the professional, academic and lived experience and how we could combine them without any one group uh, dominating. Those issues of power and some honesty in, in declaring them. Uncertainties about where this was all going, because I suppose in many ways it was, uh, it was, uh, there was a lot of action research processes going on and different worldviews, both in relation to the, the, the different perspectives people were coming from, but also because um, uh, it, 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 was a, um, 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 it, it wasn't just a UK project, that, that there, were pro there were projects uh, 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 from um, uh, other parts of Europe uh, and Malaysia. Okay. <coughs> we found um, there were some key things that we really, lessons that um, um, we felt were learnt um, in terms of this process. We're not saying we did everything uh, successfully, but um, um, some of the key things we learnt was the importance of uh, um, thinking about how we form those collaborations in the first place, how we, how we can best involve people with those different types of knowledge. Um, later I'll come back to actually different ways we use things. and We talk about boundaries and trying to make boundaries creative, and we, we talk about notions of boundary objects, things that people can share in common that help people uh, understand each other's perspective. A key thing is to actually agree what knowledge and what expertise is. 
and to validate those types of knowledge that often, um, certainly in, in the academic world, uh, might not be privileged. Academic knowledge is often privileged. Um, sometimes policy knowledge, knowledge is privileged, um, and other types of knowledge sometimes aren't even seen as knowledge. So um, a key part is to validate a knowledge, be it coming from people's lived experience of um, uh, living with health or, or social challenges, or academic knowledge, um, or um, um, a, a practitioner knowledge. Um, and for people to feel the legitimacy of their own knowledge. Sometimes it's necessary for people to actually um, build up their confidence separately in, in discussing and feeling about their knowledge and designing exercises for people uh, uh, to do that um, if it looks like one type of uh, knowledge claim is dominating. Uh, in the academic world, words often, often dominate. Not always, but often do. Um, we made a point of having a community artist recording our sessions um, and, and that was an important part of the, of the record too. We used uh, creativity uh, quite a lot. Uh, um, uh, this was actually a visual representation of actually uh, a very dynamic session, but also where there was quite a lot of tension being exchanged between people. Um, and, uh, and for all of us, we felt that Lisa's image here uh, captured it um, um, very well. Um, one of the problems is that people go into these problem uh, projects with uh, or challenges of different expectations. Community p partners, practitioners, organisations, the organisations are often looking for uh, 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 concrete, uh, uh, quite rapid outcomes in terms of seeing it as an opportunity to uh, uh, develop interventions, particularly in a time of uh, uh, austerity. They have stakeholders who, who, is, who are wanting to see those results quickly. Uh, academics sometimes are going in with a view to um, uh, uh, journal articles that might not be produced and published but for many uh, years down the line. And uh, um, there, there are different expectations coming in. And I suppose part of what we had to do was accept that but understand that and understand um, uh, w what that meant for us and what that meant for the project and agreeing um, 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 the outputs and at what times those needed to happen. In our research retreats, where we got together um, uh, uh, for two days every year, we, we paid quite a lot of careful attention to where these happen. Probably one of the, we tried to pick sort of neutral spaces. So um, and only once did we meet in a university um, space because it was connected with a wider Imagine project um, where they were doing a, an e exhibition. Um, perhaps one of the best spaces was a further educational college um, um, that uh, supported uh, uh, people with a range of health challenges, and it was during their, their vacation. Um, and, and so we had that sense of a, a space, but it wasn't a space that felt like it necessarily belonged to any one group of people. Um, similarly, in terms of activities, actually to make sure it wasn't all verbal speaking out, a bit like I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing here, but we have a, have a range of different uh, activities. And noticing the value of downtime and the, and the discussions. To begin with, we had a bit too much sort of timetable stuff, a bit like we look at this program and not enough time for people just to sit and talk in breaks. Um, So we tried to get people moving around and doing things. Uh, here was an exercise thinking about uh, 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 networks, networks of support and so on, but, but, to, 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 uh, but to represent uh, uh, things, to enact concepts, not just to talk about concepts. Okay, as I sort of get towards, towards, the, towards um, at the end, I wanted to, of course, come back to this issue of boundaries. And uh, uh, this very much borrows from the work of uh, um, Etienne Bengo and uh, um, Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm hearing something. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Um, I thought somebody was telling me to, to, to wind up. Uh, the notion of boundaries and trying to ha harness boundaries um, um, uh, creatively rather than just trying to pretend they don't exist, always to see them as problems. Um, one notion was a notion of helping people to cross boundaries, um, uh, boundaries between act academic practitioner and lived experience uh, 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 research, and activities that might support that kind of bu uh, boundary crossing. Uh, we had um, uh, one session, actually, um, as an example of that, was uh, where we had a, um, somebody called, I don't know if people are familiar with, bio dance. It's a particular type of dance. It's something, actually, that made a lot of people, including myself, feel somewhat uncomfortable. But what was quite nice about it is it made everybody, nearly everybody, apart from the person who knew the person they brought in, actually feel uncomfortable with it. So there was kind of 
a unity of experience in that sense, so that it, wasn't, it, it didn't feel like it belonged to, belonged to any one uh, uh, group. So there was a disrupting of comfort zones. Uh, it wasn't something we did right at the beginning, because actually um, uh, I don't think people would have felt comfortable at all engaging in that. I think this happened in something like the third retreat, when people started to, uh, uh, to, to know each other more. But, um, and, there, and there were some people who chose not to take part, but it, but it was a way for people to um, uh, reflect on what their experience had been like in the research project and try and express that uh, uh, through this medium of bio-dance. Um, but to think of activities that encourage that kind of boundary-crossing mutual understanding. And the other notion of boundaries is boundary objects. So um, an example of that Lisa's drawing there you, uh, um, uh, could be conceived of as a boundary object, a, a, a representation that's crossing boundaries of uh, um, uh, artistic expression but reflecting on a, a on a debate, uh, an object that people can look at from different perspectives. Um, that's an example, perhaps, of a, a creative object. Um, uh, other boundary ob objects uh, for practitioners might be practice tools, assessment tools, things that people have developed around supporting resilience, um, or more ac academic tools related to uh, evaluating research um, and trying to make those objects ones which uh, uh, can be commonly uh, uh, um, communicated um, by people. And the third kind of boundary factor here, um, that's something that uh, really important to consider is boundary spanners, people who, should, who have more than one identity. I mean, actually, it's a bit odd to say, okay, who's an academic researcher and who's a community researcher? I mean, we're all members of communities. Um, we all have lived experience of various things. True, some people have more um, uh, challenging or acute lived experience, but that can include academics, it can include practitioners. Um, and something about the whole pr um, uh, process of actually recognising different types of knowledge is very interesting because it actually encouraged practitioners and academics to feel more comfortable and open about some of their other identities and their non-academic identities and about using that and bringing that in, into research. But boundary spanners, people who genuinely have um, a, a foot in number of camps, actually we found could, could, could be really quite central to help keep the processes going and promote um, um, uh, understanding. We used um, a technique, again, from um, um, Etienne and Bev Wenger training called distributed leadership. I mean, you don't necessarily need to use that technique, but in these meetings and bringing together, we, we paid a lot of attention to um, different clusters of people who, who would have different tasks um, to focus on whether people's voices are being heard, what messages were being formed for external stakeholders, um, um, looking at um, um, how people were experiencing the environment, taking a critical look at the activities, meeting um, um, twice every day to review on that and report back to people, and making these groups of people, of the distributed leadership groups, ones which, were, which had, had a mix of uh, um, uh, people from, from, from different knowledge claims. Okay, these were just some examples which I'll uh, quickly show and then I'll, I'll finish. Um, this is the value creation framework, um, um, uh, which was one example of one of those boundary uh, spanning tools, ways in which we um, saw value as emerging um, uh, from, our, from our process, um, um, values of sharing, um, um, values being applied, um, uh, what, what impacts we generated, what transformations were made in our communities and in our processes. Um, um, it actually, we found this a really useful tool. In fact, it, um, it was somebody who had um, um, ended up leaving school at, at 16 who actually um, uh, presented this to the wider group and um, um, uh, felt um, um, most um, really developed a, a confidence uh, uh, in this because although perhaps it looks a bit con um, 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 uh, abstract up there, actually, um, um, notions about um, uh, creating value through a learning process um, uh, is one that um, um, makes, um, uh, makes sense to people, whether you're coming from academic practitioner or, or lived experience. Okay, I shall stop there. I think the idea is we, we, we talk later, isn't it?